Early on, when China's COVID-19 outbreak seemed a far-off issue to most people, biology Srinivasan was on Twitter relentlessly warning of the risks and proposing radical solutions. Balaji is uniquely prepared for this moment. He is an active Silicon Valley investor, the founder of crypto company Earn, a former CTO of Coinbase, and he's also a Stanford graduate, ex graduated expert in bioinformatics and the genetics of complex diseases. Balaji, welcome. Can you hear me now? You to, yep, got you now. Yep. Awesome. Great. All right. <laughs> Thanks for uh, joining us. Great to be here. Yeah. So, so look, when did you first realize this disease posed a threat to the world? And what was it like to recognize that most people didn't have a clue, that there was a kind of a alarming reality that everybody was oblivious? Well, I was following it in January, but um, it was the lockdown of Wuhan that made me, as well as a lot of other people, you know, recognize that this could be a very big deal because the Chinese government doesn't usually do things like that. And then I read all the scientific papers I could get my hands on, and I realized that actually, you know, this thing had the potential to be, you know, like like Bill Gates has talked about, and I think now people agree, a once-in-a-century pandemic. But I think people had and have, maybe less so now, but such a status quo bias that, um, you know, it, it was perceived as, oh, another tech person saying the world is going to change or, or something like that. Uh, and so for several weeks, I had to sort of cut a swath on, on Twitter, you know, and a bunch of other people were doing it, certainly by no means the only person, but rebutting essentially a bunch of articles that said, you know, oh, it's not going to be a deadly pandemic. And these were mainstream media outlets. It was, you know, the New York Times, it was Washington Post Perspectives, it was Vox, it was Recode, it was BuzzFeed, it was Wired. It was quite a few putting this meme out there. Now, they've since switched course, but it was really a fundamental, you know, kind of kind of breakdown. And uh, and now I think we're going to, we're unfortunately seeing more of that with like the masks don't work stuff followed by masks do work. So, uh, so that's what it was like. It was like, uh, it was, it was kind of like being Paul Revere along with a hundred other people on Twitter being Paul Revere. <laughs> Hi, Balaji. Early hey, in the Laura. Trump presidency, there was a rumor you'd be tapped to run the Food and Drug Administration. Whether or not you ever would have accepted that job, what changes would you make now to the FDA in light of COVID-19? Great question. So, um, you know, I'm actually much more pragmatic than people think. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a pragmatic uh, person, even though, you know, it might come across as radical sometimes. Um, so I would actually, you know, first you have the FDA, I'd do three things. Um, first, I'd tell, uh, I'd tell most of the people in the audience, your job won't change. Second, what I would have done, and this I wrote this plan up, you know, a long time ago, but even today it's true. Uh, I allow everybody to work from home, which is actually a huge raise for many of them. Um, you know, now today it doesn't seem like a give, but at the time it was a big give. And the third thing I would do is I would work with uh, now these new interstate compacts to decentralize the FDA in the following sense. Any applicant, any drug company, device company, biotech company that wants to submit an application to the existing FDA can do so. But they can also choose another pathway. For example, the Western States Compact, which is now California, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Nevada, they could approve drugs, devices, vaccines, et cetera, at the state or the, let's call it the interstate compact level in collaboration with A, state regulators, and B, uh, you know, Stanford, UCLA, UW, these are world-class universities there, right? The same could be true in the upper Midwest. You could have the Mayo Clinic, you know, working with regulators there. Same could be true in the Boston area, certainly with Harvard and MIT. Same could be true for the New York-centered, you know, interstate compact where you have uh, Columbia and Cornell. And these are actually the folks at these universities that do a lot of the expert review and expert panels for the FDA anyway. So it's actually not that different. But the key difference would be the FDA would actually have competition. And hmm. actually, one thing that's not very well understood is that there's existing pathways outside the FDA that already are extant. So for example, right to try for drugs, the LDT pathway for laboratory testing, compounding pharmacies, um, you know, these, but, these are pathways. Well, exist, this sound, this right? sounds like an extensive pitch for the job, which I, I'd be thrilled to see you get. It <laughs> certainly sure. would be an inter interesting one. Uh, but just quickly, because we don't have much time, I just want to throw one, a very it's, important issue to you, and that is like contact tracing is often is, is described by some as the you know, a necessary component of how we're going to reopen the economy. Economy, but it conjures up these kind of big brother-like ideas of privacy invasion. Are there blockchain or other solutions for gaining information without, you know, obviously destroying civil liberties? So I'm uh, obviously in favor of crypto and decentralization and so on, but I'm also a pragmatist. And um, it's easy to get a centralized solution up and working in, in a short period of time um, in, in a pandemic and an emergency. Uh, you know, 
we've already known, and I've tweeted about this, NSA has been surveilling all Americans and doing location tracking since at least before 2013. Snowden showed that that was already there. Uh, we already have, you know, the ability to, you know, basically, like the, the government has already been surveilling Americans. So at least Americans should get some benefit out of that. Um, and so, you know, th this is something where uh, I, I think contact tracing and what have you, uh, it has to be positioned not as a, a bad choice relative to an ideal, but as a less bad choice, you know, given the spectrum of bad choices that are available. Um, and I think that those countries that managed to get this virus under control, it's basically like fighting a war, except it's fighting a war against the virus. Once you're in peacetime and we've got a vaccine or a drug or something like that, you can hopefully back off on, on these on these kinds of policies. And if not, use crypto to decentralize. It's a challenge, all right. And one last quick question. You're in touch with a lot of tech startups working on solutions to this crisis. What are some of the best ideas you've seen? So one of the most important will be these uh, these studies of wearables. Uh, Ura, the Ura Ring is doing a study with UCSF and Fitbit and Apple Watch are doing it with Scripps. Um, wearables, if they could provide diagnostic grade measurements, uh, that would be a game changer because it would mean that everybody could get essentially real time diagnosis of whether they were coming down with COVID-19. Um, we've already seen some indications that this can work. Uh, Kinza is a smart thermometer company. They've got a, a health dashboard that seems to be predicting, um, you know, when people with, are, are getting temperatures in the U.S. and that that seems to be predicting, you know, spikes in COVID-19. Um, so, so that would be a true game changer because then you don't have to send samples back and forth to a lab. You don't have to do PCR. Um, you can just crank out 300 million smartwatches or Oura rings and equip everyone with them at all times. Um, oh, I wow. think that, that, could, that yeah. sounds great. But unfortunately, this is all the time we have. I'm sure many of us would love to hear more of your ideas, but thank sure. you for your time. And sure. everybody, this is where I leave you. Thanks for including me, Michael. Laura, it was our pleasure. Thanks so much for being here as well. Thank you, Balaji. And thanks all of you for tuning in. I'll be at back at 5 p.m. for our special for charity happy hour music show. Coming up next, we have uh, the Capital Control session hosted by Aaron Stanley and Kristen Smith. But from us, bye for now. <laughs>